The first day of the war, two Messerschmitt 109s were on the tail of a damaged Soviet Seagull fighter. Suddenly, another Seagull appeared behind the two German fighters. The Germans left the damaged plane and went after the new arrival. They put several holes through the Soviet aircraft, but were unable to shoot it down. This seagull was flown by Lieutenant Rech Karlov. This was his baptism of fire. Grigory Rech Karlov shot down his first German aircraft five days later. He went on to score 61 victories, making him the third highest scoring Soviet ace of the war. He was twice decorated as a hero of the Soviet Union, the USSR's highest award. A medical board had declared Rech Karlov unfit for combat because of color blindness. But when he reported to his regiment, the war had just begun and he was immediately pressed into service. Товарищ капитан, сержант Ричкалов прибыл в ваше распоряжение. Медицинская комиссия признан негодным, но прошу зачислить... Видишь тринадцатую чайку? Так точно. Быстренько подготовь ее к вылету, отвезешь в бельцы пакет. Есть! In 1941, the main Soviet fighters were the I-153 Seagull and the I-16. They were designed by the Polykarpov Bureau, led by Nikolai Nikolaevich Polykarpov. The Seagull had a tight turning circle, but it was painfully slow compared to the German Messerschmitt 109. Soviet pilots first encountered the 109 during the Spanish Civil War. It was immediately clear that it posed a serious threat. The Messerschmitt 109 was designed by Willy Messerschmitt of the Bayerische Flugzeugwerke Company. It would become the most produced fighter of the war. By June 1941, the latest F variant had a top speed of 390 miles per hour, compared to the Seagull's 266 miles per hour. Its two machine guns and one 20mm cannon meant the 109 was also more heavily armed. The maneuverability of the Seagull meant Soviet pilots could often escape, but they could never fight on their own terms. On the first day of the war, more than 300 Soviet aircraft were shot down, but as many as 1,400 were destroyed on the ground. The worst losses were in Belorussia, where General Chernyuk's 9th Air Division, equipped with new MiG-3s, lost 347 of its 409 aircraft. Sergei Alexandrovich Chernyuk was a hero of the Soviet Union, a veteran of the Spanish Civil War and the first Soviet pilot to shoot down a Messerschmitt 109. But now he became a scapegoat for the Air Force's failures and was arrested and shot. The Western Front lost 738 aircraft, 528 of them on the ground. When the Air Force commander in Belorussia, General Kopets, realized the scale of the disaster, he shot himself. These men were talented young pilots who'd been rapidly promoted to high command to fill the vacuum created by Stalin's purge of senior Air Force officers. But when war came, they were out of their depth. Despite the enormous losses of the first day, the remnants of the Soviet Air Force began to fight back. On the 25th of June, 
27 Soviet Tupolev SB bombers attacked the German 2nd Panzer Group as it massed to cross the Shara River in Belorussia. The bombers destroyed vehicles and took out the river crossing. On the way back, the SBs were attacked by German fighters. Ten were shot down. Soviet ground attack and fighter regiments were under army command, but bombers were under front or army group command. It proved almost impossible to coordinate their actions. Bombers attacked without fighter protection, while fighters were ordered to attack ground targets. Poor Soviet tactics were also being exposed. Bomber pilots had been trained to fly in loose formations, meaning their machine guns couldn't cover each other. Soviet tactics and organization needed a rapid overhaul. Nevertheless, Soviet bombers continued to attack German ground forces, as well as strategic targets including Königsberg in East Prussia, Warsaw, the Romanian port of Constanza, and the Ploiesti oil refineries. One of the pilots defending the vital Romanian oil fields was Oberleutnant Gunther Wahl. On the 26th of June, his unit intercepted Soviet bombers returning from a raid on Ploiesti. Rahl shot down three bombers. His fellow pilots destroyed six more. Gunther Rahl enlisted in the infantry in 1936. Two years later, he transferred to the Luftwaffe to train as a fighter pilot. He first saw action over France in 1940, where he scored two victories. He ended the war as Germany's third most successful fighter pilot, with 275 kills to his name. German pilots not only had the advantage of superior aircraft, they also had excellent training. They followed the maxim of the legendary First World War fighter race, the Red Baron himself, Manfred von Richthofen. Find the enemy and shoot him down. Anything else is nonsense. German fighter pilots fought almost a separate war, more like an athletic contest, in which only their individual scores mattered. Drawing on their experience of the Spanish Civil War, Luftwaffe fighter pilots had invented their own tactics they flew in a flexible formation made up of two pairs, known as the Finger Four, which allowed them to utilize their superior speed. Other air forces, including the British and Soviet, flew in rigid V-shaped formations, in which pilots spent most of their time concentrating on holding position. In the Soviet case, a tight formation was essential because most aircraft did not yet have radios. Section leaders had to communicate by waggling their wings or using hand signals. It left the pilots with no freedom to maneuver. In the weeks leading up to the German invasion, a brand new aircraft began to arrive at Soviet ground attack regiments. It was the Il-2, and it would become the most famous Soviet aircraft of the war. The Il-2 Sturmovik was designed by Sergei Ilyushin and entered service in May 1941. His creation was soon nicknamed the Flying Tank. The Il-2 carried cannon, machine guns, bombs and rockets and was protected from ground fire by armor plating. More than 36,000 were eventually built, making it the most produced military aircraft in history. The first unit to receive the Il-2 was the 4th Sturmovik Regiment. But the war began before its pilots had had a chance to train with it. They'd practiced takeoffs and landings, but hadn't flown in formation or even fired the aircraft's weapons yet. 
Some of the pilots had never seen an RS rocket before, and now they were expected to use them in combat. On the 27th of June, pilots Spitsin, Filipov, and Kolobayev flew off on their first mission. They attacked a German column from low altitude. They could only use their machine guns, since the 20 mm cannon had a production defect. All the pilots returned to the airfield. Kolobayev's plane was riddled with holes. The fuselage was covered with oil. The aircraft was a write-off, but he had survived. A week later, the regiment received a citation from the front commander for destroying nine crossings over the Berezina River. But losses were high. By mid-July, of the regiment's 56 aircraft, only 10 remained in service. In August, the regiment handed its last three aircraft to a neighboring unit and headed east for rebuilding. In the first summer of the war, an Aleutian II was destroyed on average after just eight or nine missions. In some regiments, after just three or four. But better tactics and training would gradually improve these survival rates. By 1945, the average had gone up to 90 missions. That autumn, Grigory Richkarlov was wounded during a combat mission. Despite serious leg injuries, he managed to land his aircraft back at base. By then, his score stood at three German aircraft destroyed. By the end of 1941, the Soviet Air Force had lost more than 20,000 aircraft. The Luftwaffe, just 3,800. But despite this success, the Luftwaffe proved unable to effectively target Soviet transport and infrastructure. The Luftwaffe had been designed primarily to support ground operations. It lacked the aircraft to carry out strategic bombing. The Luftwaffe was unable to prevent the evacuation of Soviet industry to the Urals or, crucially, prevent Red Army reinforcements moving up from the Russian interior. German air raids against Moscow underlined this weakness. Soviet fighters, supported by formidable anti-aircraft defenses, were able to prevent any serious damage to the capital. By the winter counter-attack, the Soviet Air Force outnumbered the Luftwaffe by almost three to one. And soon, it would start to receive some desperately needed modern aircraft. Above an airfield in Russia, an aircraft slowed, began to shudder, and then fell into a spin. Down below, its designer, Semyon Lavoshkin, feared the worst. The day before, he told the pilots, don't test it for tailspin. You'll destroy the prototype and yourselves. But the pilot quickly recovered and returned to level flight. Two weeks later, the State Defense Committee approved production of the Lag 3 fighter with a new M82 engine. It would be called the LA-5. 
Its predecessor, the Lag-3, was designed in 1940 by Lavoshkin, Gorbanov, and Gudkov. Because of the USSR's shortage of aluminium, the aircraft had a wooden frame with key sections made from a wood veneer that was treated with Bakelite and compressed at high temperature. This made the wood very strong and fire resistant, but it was heavy compared to aluminium. Its weight and an underpowered engine made the Lag-3 sluggish and unmaneuverable. In the autumn of 1941, it was decided to cease production of Lag fighters and concentrate instead on the Yak-7. In late 1941, the Yak-7B was considered the best Soviet fighter. It was armed with one cannon and two machine guns and had a top speed of 365 miles per hour. The Lavoshkin Design Bureau faced closure. Its savior was a new, more powerful M82 air-cooled engine. Installed in the Lag-3 airframe, it gave birth to the LA-5, and the Lavoshkin Bureau was back in business. On the 21st of March, 1942, a few days before the Bureau was evacuated to the Caucasus, test pilot Vasily Mishenko took the prototype for its first flight. In the first year of the war, the Soviets had lost huge swathes of territory and suffered devastating losses. Of 22,600 tanks available at the start of the war, about 2,000 were left. From 20,000 aircraft, just 2,000. And of 110,000 guns and mortars, 2,800. These losses had to be made good quickly, but at the same time, Soviet factories had to be evacuated east to safety. The People's Commissariat of Aviation Industry had evacuated 118 factories, 85% of its facilities. Nine major tank plants were evacuated. By the end of 1941, more than 10 million people and 2,500 enterprises had been relocated. The task required more than one and a half million rail wagons. On arrival, most factories resumed production immediately. The Soviet Air Force, meanwhile, was putting into practice the painful lessons of 1941. In March 1942, the Air Force received a new commander, General Novikov. He immediately recommended that its units be concentrated into air armies, making it easier to manage and coordinate air operations. Soviet fighter pilots learned new tactics, some drawn from combat experience, others borrowed from the Luftwaffe. The Air Force abandoned its mixed air groups. Instead, fighters, Sturmoviks and bombers were formed into specialized divisions. Obsolete aircraft, such as the Seagull, were gradually replaced by new Yaks, Lavoshkins, and Ilyushins. The LA-5 made its debut in August 1942 over Stalingrad. Gunther Rahl gave his assessment of the new aircraft. The Russians were quick learners. The LA-5, based on the inefficient Lag-3, was a great plane. All German pilots soon learned to respect the LA-5. It had particularly impressive performance at low altitude, where it could outturn a Messerschmitt 109 and outclimb a Fokker Wolf 190. However, the Soviets continued to suffer heavy pilot losses. The situation was described in a report by the 49th Fighter Regiment. The LA-5 is the best type of Soviet fighter. The regiment's losses are explained by the fact that 45% of personnel are young pilots. Casualties included three sergeants with 15 to 17 flying hours on LA-5s and two lieutenants with similar background. Only one in five is an experienced pilot. 
pilot training would remain one of the Soviet Air Force's greatest failings until the end of the war. Soviet flight schools suffered from a shortage of instructors and of fuel. Pilots graduated after just 90 days of basic instruction. They concentrated on takeoffs and landings. Acrobatics was strictly forbidden because they led to too many accidents. As a result, pilots often arrived at their unit with as little as eight hours flying experience. Often, none of it on the aircraft the unit was equipped with. Nor had they been trained how to fly in bad weather. Flight school graduates received virtually no instruction in air combat. Most had done some target shooting. But few knew much about deflection shooting or how to use their gun sights. These men were expected to fight German pilots with hundreds of combat missions under their belt. But what they lacked in experience, they made up for in spirit. Sergei Gorolov typified the commitment of Soviet fighter pilots. We were eager for battle and ready to die in combat. We even said our goodbyes before going on a mission. In late 1942, Grigory Rychkarlov's regiment was withdrawn from the front in order to retrain on new aircraft. American Aero Cobras, sent to the USSR as part of the Allied Lend-Lease program of military aid. Of all the types of Allied aircraft supplied through Lend-Lease, this was the pilot's favorite. The Bell P-39 Aero Cobra had one unusual design feature. The engine was situated behind the pilot. Half of the 10,000 Aero Cobras built by Bell were sent to the Soviet Union under the terms of Lend-Lease. The aircraft carried a 37mm cannon and two heavy caliber machine guns. Besides Rechkalov, other Aero Cobra pilots included Nikolai Guleyev, the fourth highest scoring Soviet ace with 57 confirmed kills, and Alexander Pokrishkin, the third highest with 59 kills. Rechkalov, who liked to hunt alone in his Aero Cobra, won 42 victories in 1943. He finished the war with 61 confirmed victories. By the war's end, Rechkalov had twice been decorated as a hero of the Soviet Union. In April 1943, the Red Army's North Caucasus Front began an offensive against the Kuban Bridgehead on the Black Sea coast. Their aim was to break through the German fortification system known as the Blue Line and to liberate Taman. After six days of fierce fighting, the 56th Army had succeeded in capturing just one German stronghold, the village of Krimskaya. Any further Red Army advance became impossible in the face of massive German airstrikes launched from Luftwaffe bases in the Kerch Peninsula. The Soviet offensive had to be called off on the 15th of May. That summer, 
A vicious struggle for air superiority raged over the Kuban bridgehead. On one side, the Soviet 4th Air Force under General Vershinin. On the other, Field Marshal von Richthofen's 4th Air Fleet. It would prove the beginning of the end for Luftwaffe supremacy on the Eastern Front. The Soviet Union's top ace was Ivan Nikitovich Kazhadub. Kazhadub spent two years as a flight instructor and only joined a frontline fighter regiment in the spring of 1943, where he flew LA-5s. By the end of the war, he had shot down 62 enemy aircraft, making him the highest scoring Allied ace of the war. He was also a three times hero of the Soviet Union. In his first 40 missions, Kazhadub failed to shoot down any enemy aircraft. Instead, he often returned with his own plane badly damaged. <laughs> But his chance would come at the Battle of Kursk. In the summer of 1943, near Kursk, the Wehrmacht planned a massive two-pronged offensive that would lead to the encirclement and destruction of substantial Red Army forces. The Red Army had never before withstood the combined German assault of tanks, artillery and aircraft. Kolobayev, meanwhile, was instructing young pilots of the 7th Guard Sturmovik Regiment. Above all, Kolobayev extolled the virtues of aggression in his pilots. He urged them to attack without hesitation. By 1943, Soviet Sturmovik regiments had developed tactics based on solid combat experience. They began with a nosedive from 3,000 feet to just a few hundred. Then they would form a circle. This formation gave them freedom to maneuver, select their ground targets, and engage them with cannon, machine guns, bombs, and rockets. As they made their attack, the aircraft following behind protected them from German fighters. Just before the Battle of Kursk, IL-2 units received a new anti-tank weapon, the P-TAB aerial bomb. Grigory Cherkashin was one pilot to use the new weapon. P-TABs are our best weapon against tanks. They're a beast. Six Sturmoviks approach an armored column. The first unloads its four hatches, then the second, then the third. The Germans unleashed their Kursk offensive on the 5th of July, 1943. The next day, Kazhadub shot down his first German aircraft. Over the next two days, he shot down three more. In one battle, Lieutenant Gorovitz was credited with destroying nine Stukas, the last by ramming it, before his heavily damaged LA-5 was shot down. At the cost of his own life, Alexander Konstantinovich Gorovitz set a Soviet record of destroying nine enemy aircraft in a single mission. The exact number of aircraft shot down by the World War II aces remains the subject of heated debate. The nature of air combat made it difficult to be sure if an aircraft had been shot down or just damaged. The Soviet Air Force, like all others, required victories to be corroborated by witnesses in the air or on the ground, or for kills to be confirmed by gun camera footage. But pilots on all sides were prone to exaggerate the number of aircraft they'd shot down. In the Battle of Britain, for instance, 
Fighter pilots claimed for about twice as many aircraft as were actually shot down. Ich bin abgeschossen. Ich kann das Flugzeug nicht steuern. Der Motor brennt. At Kursk, the air battle raged with as much ferocity as the fighting on the ground. One thing was clear. The Luftwaffe no longer had things all its own way. Experienced German aces flying high-performance modern aircraft continued to exact a heavy toll on the Soviet Air Force. But Sergei Gorilov exemplified the Soviet learning curve. By Kursk, I'd learned how to maneuver and shoot accurately. Now we had reliable radios and ground control. While I destroyed one plane in 1941, in 1942, I got five, and in summer of 1943, 20. The Lavoshkin fighter played an important role in his success. In 1943, it received a new engine with direct fuel injection, which made it a solid match for the latest Messerschmitt 109. On the 3rd of August, Gorolov and nine other LA-5 pilots were escorting Sturmoviks to their target when they were jumped by 35 enemy fighters. In the ensuing dogfight, eight Messerschmitts were shot down two of them by Gorolov. When attacking a formation of Soviet Sturmoviks and fighter escorts, German fighters would climb 500 meters above them. There, they would circle, waiting for the optimum moment to make a diving attack. Their plan was simple, strike at maximum speed, take out a Sturmovik, and then climb away to safety. These high-speed diving attacks were made at more than 400 miles per hour. The escort fighters' orders were to stay with the slower, less maneuverable Sturmoviks and protect them from these attacks. They would turn to face the attacking German aircraft and open a defensive fire, which, even if it missed, might force him to break off his attack. The escort would then rejoin the formation. It could be a frustrating experience for Soviet fighter pilots, forbidden to pursue and destroy damaged enemy fighters. German aces scored many victories with these high-speed diving attacks. But there weren't enough of them to prevent the Sturmoviks carrying out their mission, to bomb and strafe German ground forces without mercy. On the 4th of February, 1944, First Lieutenant Kazhidub was awarded the gold star of a hero of the Soviet Union for destroying 20 enemy aircraft in 146 missions. His comrade, Sergei Kramarenko, described this exceptional pilot. Lots of pilots envied him, thinking he must be really lucky hitting so many planes without being hit. I mean, it's really rare. But after flying with him a few times, I realized that behind the luck lay lightning reactions and excellent situational awareness. Kozadal had an instinctive understanding of aerial combat. He was always in the right place at the right time. Then all he had to do was push the gun button. 
Wasser. Die Maschine brennt. Ich kann nicht rausspringen. Die Luke verklemmt. In 1943, British and American Air Forces launched their combined bomber offensive against Germany. The Casablanca Directive stated its goals. The progressive destruction and dislocation of the German military, industrial and economic system and the undermining of the morale of the German people to a point where their capacity for armed resistance is fatally weakened. Germany was to be bombed around the clock. The Americans attacking by day, the British at night. On the Eastern Front, German pilots were able to hunt freely. But against Allied bombers and their fighter escorts, they no longer had the option to fight only on their own terms. On two fronts, the Luftwaffe was slowly being ground into submission. Shortly before dawn, on the 23rd of June, 1944, the alert was sounded at the 7th Guard Sturmovik Regiment. All personnel formed up on the airfield. The regiment had been completely remanned three times, and the men who began the war in Belarusia were long gone. Commander Kolobayev had been promoted and transferred. The men stood to attention. A parade was being held to mark the start of Operation Bagration. Это знамя обогрено кровью наших боевых друзей, сражавшихся в этих местах ещё в первые месяцы войны. Теперь в строю гвардейцев стоит их достойная смена. Operation Bagration with Sturmovik regiments in the lead, resulted in the destruction of an entire German army group. The Red Army had cracked the Eastern Front wide open. A commission had been sent to assess the efficiency of the 230th Ground Assault Division, of which the 7th Guards Regiment was a part. They found that in one day, the division destroyed more than 100 vehicles, six tanks, and 20 guns. As the Germans retreated through Belarusia, traffic jams formed, particularly around the river crossings. With the Luftwaffe nowhere to be seen, the columns were at the mercy of the Soviet Air Force. In April 1945, the Soviet Air Force prepared to support the Red Army's final offensive across the Oder River and into Berlin. They would outnumber the Luftwaffe almost seven to one, but the German 6th Air Fleet could be counted on to fight desperately in defense of the capital. Иначе в случае разрушения авиации противника, наши войска, наступающие на Берлин, останутся без горючки и снарядов. Ключевые точки операции в следующем. Three pairs of LA-7s took off to guard the crossings. Ivan Kashadub was in the lead. Below them, they spotted 32 Focke-Wulf 190s flying in two groups. Kajadub descended, slipped under the German formation, and attacked the lead aircraft.
A Fokker Wolf opened fire on Kajadub. His wingman shot down the German at almost point-blank range. Using their speed, the Soviet fighters climbed and attacked the second enemy group. Kajadub destroyed another plane. Then another. A dogfight began as pilots twisted and turned, trying to get into a good firing position on an enemy aircraft. In spite of their superior numbers, the Fokker Wolves turned tail and fled west, pursued by the Lavoshkins. Back at base, the scores were tallied up. Kajadub had shot down three aircraft, getting away with a few holes in his tail. Gromakovsky had two, and Kumanitsi, Stetsenko and Olov, one each. The once mighty Luftwaffe had been chased from the sky and Soviet fighter pilots roamed at will over the enemy's capital. Several became aces in the final days of the war. Amongst them, Vladimir Gromakovsky, who shot down five aircraft during the Berlin offensive, and Viktor Alexandruk, who claimed seven. On the night of the 9th of May, pilots woke to the sound of gunshots. They sprung out of bed and raced outside with their sidearms. German regiments were still trying to fight their way to the west, sometimes attacking airfields in their path. But the shots were being fired into the air. News had arrived of the German unconditional surrender. The war was finally over. For the Soviet Air Force, it had been a costly and bloody struggle. But from the devastating defeats of 1941 had emerged a ruthless and powerful Air Force that had played its full part in the final Soviet victory.